I'm Gabrielle Banks. I'm a clinical psychologist at the Center for Advancement of Youth. Um, I am excited to speak with you all tonight. Um, one of the best parts of my job is getting to share information with members of the community. That's one of the best parts of being a psychologist because I got into this job to make sure that families and children and parents know exactly what they need to know to help their children. Um, so we can start with a few disclosures. First one is I am, uh, as I said, a clinical psychologist at the Center for Advancement of Youth. Uh, so shout out to our members of the center, our team members who are here today to support. Um, and I am a junior league member, so I am doubly excited to be here for this event. My last disclosure is one more. I don't have children, so I'm talking to parents day in and day out about how to parent more effectively. And I don't have anybody at home. So I say a lot of times, I understand a little bit of what this is and I'm an expert in child development and child behavior. You all are the experts in your children. So together, we merge that expertise. Um, so what I do have is about 10 years of experience, clinical experience working with children, with and without medical complexity, over 10 years of working with children within a research capacity. Um, and I see about um, 30 families a week. So that's been for the last, so there is, there, even though I don't have children at home, I have children everywhere else I go. All right. So today what we're gonna do, or tonight what we're gonna do is review anxiety and anxiety disorders. We're gonna talk about some considerations for parents. We're also gonna talk about um, and how parents respond. We're also gonna review treatments that work. I'm gonna, I'm played around with how far I can move. Um, I'm sorry if you feel a little bit of, hear a little bit of feedback, so I'm gonna step back just a little bit if that's okay. Okay, so anxiety, what is it? What does it look like? So anxiety is worry, fear, um, general nervous anticipation about something that's coming in the future. Um, it's some, for some people, it can be the sense of something bad is going to happen or embarrassment when something happens that you didn't want to happen in front of other people. Um, it can be accompanied by changes in your body, so increases in heart rate. You get a stomach ache, your head hurts, you get sweaty palms, um, headaches, uh, muscle problems, and it's just general discomfort. If you're anxious, that means you're uncomfortable. So raise your hand if you've ever felt anxious. Okay, so that's a lot of people. The reason for that is because anxiety is normal. Anxiety is healthy. There are some levels of anxiety and worry that keep us safe. So it's a normal reaction to different events in your life. It's what keeps us looking both ways before we cross the street because we anticipate that if we don't, we might get hit by a car. So we have to say, stop, wait, look both ways so that we can stay alive. Um, so it's important for success as well as safety and that if you weren't worried about um, a big test coming up, you wouldn't study. So then you don't study for the test, you don't do well on the test. If you're not worried about doing a good job at your, at your job, then you, know, you don't finish your test. You come in late, you get fired. So it's hard to be successful if you don't have some level of anxiety or worry of bad things that could happen if you don't do certain things. Um, it also, again, helps us to assess and respond to different events in inappropriate ways. That's that stop and think reflex that stops us to say, well, ooh, maybe I shouldn't have said that because it would make my friend feel bad. Or maybe I should say this because I want my friend to feel encouraged. If you didn't care about how people responded to you, then you wouldn't, um, then you wouldn't maybe kind of put a check on some of the things that you say. So all of these examples or examples about how, of how anxiety in certain levels are normal. So what are some common causes of anxiety for children? Just yell them out for me. What have you all been noticing as a, as a what do you think is something that children are generally kind of anxious about? School. School. Mm -hmm. Siblings. Siblings, yeah. Separation. Separation, uh-huh. Anything else? Sports. Sports? What about the sports? Um, just the performance on the field. Performance on the field, yeah. Mm -hmm. 
I was like, you're going to get to one small mouth. <laughs> That's it. Anything else? Any kind of uh, pressure. Any pr any kind of pressure, yeah. Feelings that you're not not meeting the expectations of other people. Mm -hmm. My son, he knows we're gonna go somewhere. He can't sleep the night before. No. It's not like a bad anxiety, but it's like I'm like, okay, if you don't go to sleep, it'll be a cranky day tomorrow. Uh huh. Yeah. Having so sometimes that can be excited anticipation. Like I'm ex so excited, we're gonna go somewhere fun, or it could be dread. We're going to the doctor's office. What's gonna happen at the doctor's office? So all of those things here. So first day of school, new activities, anything that is new. Um, sleeping away from home for the first time. Dogs, big scary dogs with lots of teeth that can bite. Spiders, and everybody yells at when they are yells when they see them. Um, new people, separation, like you said, performing um, in front of people on sports teams on stage. Um, car accidents, things that they see. Bad weather. Bad guys and bad characters, scary characters that you see on television just in passing. I'll tell you, like around Halloween, it's just like everybody, it seems like everybody wants to be scared when they watch television. And so all these scary movies and things come up and I think, oh, there, there could be children that are watching this. I have a, a reaction when I see um, scary monsters on television. Uh, COVID-19, that's something that's scary for kids too. So all of these pieces are common and scary, and it's very normal for kids to have a reaction to them. Anxiety becomes a problem when it becomes notably difficult for a child to regulate themselves and regulate their emotions. And specifically, anxiety becomes a disorder when it negatively impacts a child's functioning. Specifically with sleep, eating, peer relationships, activities, going to school, interacting with their family. That's when we're more concerned because this level of anxiety has now impacted their functioning. So we're having some internet difficulties, so I can't show you just a little bit of a clip to lighten the load, but if you've seen um, the movie Inside Out that came out a few years back, um, it talks about the different, not scientifically accurate, but it is a nice a nice introduction to, to emotions for children and it's a nice jumping off point for parents to um, for parents to start the conversations about emotions. But what you'll see is um, fear is one of the main emotions and he kind of embodies worry, fear, anxious, um, and anxiety and anxious, anxious feelings. And so in this clip he's um, a big spider comes down in front of the main character and fear takes over and you see fear kind of get really what we call dysregulated, really, really scared, uh, running around and kind of turning the mind knobs to help calm the little girl down. So in terms of um, anxiety in you, when we, so getting back to thinking about anxiety disorders and when anxiety has increased so much that there really is a negative impact on the functioning of the child, and we see that globally about 11% up to 12% of you have some type of clinically significant anxiety disorder. That's across the world. Um, but really 12% we can't even, like, it's one in 10 plus a little bit of a person, so it's not really, a, it's, 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 it can be a lot in terms of your classroom, say a classroom of 10 kids, maybe one child has some significant anxiety. Um, when we think about all the children in the world, it's a smaller, it's a smaller, uh, smaller number. Now the U.S. prevalence, though, has been reported to, has been documented to be almost as high as 31.9% of children in the U.S. having some type of clinically significant anxiety symptoms. That's a bigger, that's, that's a bigger percentage. That's almost a third. That's almost one in three. So um, there are pieces about anxiety that we know you can help grow. Um, but for the most part, when children have pervasive symptoms, it's not something that you can, that children will outgrow without having some type of assistance. There are develop developmental stages a key component to anxiety um, because certain behaviors and certain fears are very much expected for certain age groups. 
you would expect your 12 month old to have difficulty separating from mom, our primary caregiver. That is expected. Um, your 12 year old having a difficult time separating from you to even kind of be downstairs while you're up here, that's a little bit different because we would expect that after 12 years of life, a child would have enough experience to, to, to know that being separate from mom and dad is not really as bad as it may have seemed a long time ago. I've had I've, I've done some new learning and learned that it's not really that bad. For so 12 year olds or older children who are still having those difficulties, now we see that it is impacting their functioning because they're not functioning in the same way we would expect other 12 year olds to function. So that's one thing to look out for. Um, and as I said before, it does not always go away on its own. So it's not going to go away if we just sleep it under the rug. It's something that uh, we have to address either with professional help or there, I'm going to give you some tips today for how to manage it at home. So I wanted to just throw up uh, some recent some recent developments in the literature um, that discuss the implications of COVID-19. So that 11.6% of global prevalence of, of anxiety, that was pre-COVID. Post-COVID-19, in a study that was a meta-analytic um, meta study that collected data from a whole bunch of studies um, around April of 2020, saw a, almost a doubling in the global prevalence rates of anxiety. Um, and that is related to all of these pieces. So these children had just dramatic disruptions in their lives. Um, school was closed. Quarantine for a lot of people. They had losses of loved ones. They had pretty significant changes and disruptions that would increase anyone's level of anxiety. So that level for adult anxiety also shot up too, but we definitely saw it in our kids. We'll go to the next one. All right, so what do you all think are some symptoms that are commonly associated with anxiety? So if a child is anxious, what does that look like to you? What did you, what would you see? Ticks. Ticks? Mm -hmm. uh, hurt, crying. Stomach hurt. Yeah, stomach hurt. Crying. Crying, uh-huh. Shaking or cribbling. Shaking, cribbling, so kind of some psychomotor agitation, so shaking and the yeah, tensing up. Decreased appetite. Decreased appetite, yeah. So not really as hungry. It's kind of related to that stomach not feeling so good. I don't really want to eat anything. And then it's going to create a vicious cycle, too, because you can you not eat. You can, your appetite can be so decreased, and you can not have enough food, that then all of a sudden the kind of harmful bacteria grows, and then it starts making your tummy ache even more. Anything else? These are all good. I think they are almost all on the list. Um, and ticks is a great one that didn't make the list, but it should be on the list. So all of these pieces are connected with anxiety. So you have poor concentration, being super clingy, um, poor sleep, and a lot of fatigue comes along with it. Stomach aches with vomiting, frequent headaches. Um, and some, sometimes these don't appear to have a clear cause. So um, a lot of times families that we see will say, well, he's been complaining of a headache for months. We've taken him to the doctor and the doctor doesn't see anything wrong. Or she's been complaining of a stomach ache for such a long time. We've taken him to the doctor. There's nothing wrong. So it's medically unexplained um, is the term that we use for it. So we can't really pinpoint it. But generally, then, then our next piece is, well, what's going on that may make the child feel more uncomfortable in certain spaces? Um, we can go to the next slide. So there are uh, there are a number of anxiety disorders. The anxiety disorders, even though again we're talking about that 11.6% and that 30% um, in U.S. children, it's still um, these disorders really you wouldn't say they aren't as prevalent as you would think. That's not that's to say one third of children do not have separation disorder um, or excuse me, separation anxiety disorder, or like 11% 11% of children don't necessarily have selective mutism. But what we're seeing we're seeing is that those rates are really kind of in that one percent range for like every year one percent of children of all children are diagnosed with these different types of disorders but what i have here that are in the, in the darker um that's in the darker font is uh, some of the most common some of the most common disorders that we see in children 
Um, so separation, so briefly, separation anxiety disorder is specifically um, a disorder related to a child's discomfort, not only discomfort um, with the separation from their parent or their primary caregiver, it is also this feeling that something bad is going to happen to them or that caregiver if they are not connected um, or if they are not within eyesight of the, of the caregiver. Um, so because of that, again, functioning has decreased because they're refusing to go off and play or go off and enjoy the gymnastics game because mom drops them off and doesn't and doesn't stay in the whole time or there's difficulty going and staying with grandparents so mom has to be at home all the time because um, because kids won't separate so just if it is impacting you as a parent then that means it's impacting your child's functioning and it's impacting family functioning. So that does count as a significant area for impairment. So social and performance related anxiety, I kind of merge those together sometimes, but um, social uh, anxiety is related to specifically having difficulties interacting with other people for fear that they will think negatively of you, that there will be some type of negative perception of you by your peers. And so these are children who don't do a lot of speaking, they get anxious around not only big crowds, but even small groups of people. Um, lots of ruminating about what they've said. They're kind of double checking to make sure they, they said the right thing in front of others. And then performance anxiety is along the same thing, but it's more so related to standing up and talking to people. Um, school avoidance is, kind of falls under that because sometimes school, the two things that happen at school are that you have to perform because you, you might not have to stand up in front of everyone, but you have to do your work. You have to do your work to the satisfaction of your teachers. You have to stay in line with your behavior to the satisfaction of your teachers, and then you have to figure out how to get along with your peers. People who are nice to you, who are your friends, and then people who are not nice to you. So all of that happens at school. So school avoidance is another component uh, related to anxiety that falls under here. So generalized anxiety disorder is um, mostly, most often diagnosed in adulthood, but adults who are diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder definitely report a long-standing history of anxiety that dated back to their early childhood years. And selective mutism is um, another fair, uh, fairly rare, um, fairly rare disorder, but it just characterizes the uh, as children not speaking at a time and place when they would normally be expected to speak. So these are kids that are little chatterboxes at home when they're excited and happy and comfortable, but as soon as somebody comes to visit the home, they're quiet. When it's time to order their own meal at Chick-fil-A, they're quiet. When they go to school, they're not saying anything. The teachers don't even know what they know because they refuse to speak. So that is selective mutism. Um, kind of in a nutshell, that one is a little bit more difficult uh, because younger children generally um, Younger children, you see, it, you see it in younger children, but we don't diagnose it as often because there are generally other developmental considerations to, that we make before we get to, to the selective features of diagnosis. But the key component is that these children are able to speak, they are just choosing not to. All right, we'll go to the next one. All right, so there are other disorders that are associated with anxiety, so you can have anxiety and this at the same time. One of them is other anxiety disorders. So folks who have generalized anxiety disorder, these are people who are afraid of a little, of, of not well, every little thing, but small things that happen in day-to-day -day life and big things that come across in day-to-day -day life. So you would imagine that if you're a person that's worried about all of that, you could also have social anxiety disorder because you're worried about lots of day-to-day -day, um, encounters and day-to-day -day experiences. So folks with GAD generally also have some type of other um, anxiety disorder kind of classification. We would just kind of, it still falls under the umbrella of GAD. However, if you are a person person or a child who has social anxiety disorder, that, that doesn't necessarily mean you'll have GAD. That may mean that your anxiety is specifically related to social interaction. Um, depression is another diagnosis that we commonly see with kids who have anxiety because if anxiety is this sense of impending dread and this constant feeling as though something bad is going to happen, that can negatively impact your mood. You feel like, well, what, what is good in the world? Because everywhere I go, I feel uncomfortable. Every time I think about something, I start to feel uncomfortable about it. So it can definitely um, start to, you can definitely start to see a deterioration in mood. You can start to see a deterioration in motivation, which is a key component of depression. 
um, and also with disruptive behaviors like ADHD and oppositional defiant disorder. So these are children where it's not necessarily, it's not a chicken or the egg situation here. It's one of those pieces where so we're not saying that anxiety is caused in either one of these disorders. What we're saying is that the children who have these disorders frequently have negative interactions with people in their environment. So their teachers, they're also their caring adults, like their parents um, and their grandparents, they're constantly being corrected. They're constantly recognizing that they're, that they're getting in trouble more than other kids. And so there is a little bit of a cyclical effect where there are children who are having a hard time with all these other components and then they start to negatively anticipate their interactions that they'll have in the future. So this likely won't go right. What if I get in trouble again tomorrow? What if I lose my privileges again tomorrow? Because this keeps on happening. What if they don't let me go to the Children's Museum because I got in trouble for talking outside, talking too loud in class again? So those things are common. So when we think about those disruptive behaviors, what is that kind of that opens up a new question of is this anxiety or is this just a strong little child? Because sometimes you have both of those things happening at the same time. So you have a child who is about this 50% I'm anxious about it, and the other 50% is I just don't want to do it. And I'm used to not having to do the things that I don't want to do. So I'm going to dig my heels in and say, no, 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 I'm not going to do this. So um, what we do to help parents kind of delineate and kind of figure out what's going on there as we look for patterns and behavior. Is this a behavior that comes up specifically around trying new things? Is this a behavior that comes up right before we're going to school or situations that are, are going to the doctor's office? Um, is, does the child have a history of limit testing behaviors? That's how you can know if you know you have a strong willed child. This is a child that kind of says no to almost everything from the beginning or kind of does just push limits when you try to correct, they also pull back and they want to do things their way. That lets us know that we're looking at strong will in addition to anxiety or maybe just strong will. How persistent and consistent is it? So a lot of times families will say, oh, well, they are really nervous about going to soccer practice, but when their best friend is there, then they're not as nervous. Or so that you see that there's some caveats there. It's not consistent that they're having what you would perceive to be an anxious response. And so that lets us know that there may be some other pieces that are either distracting them or helping allay some of that anxiety, or maybe there are other factors at play since it's not as consistent. Um, either way, you can respond similarly, and so we'll talk about that later. Right now, so um, how? So now we'll shift into how parents can respond to anxiety. This is another clip that uh, we are not able to show, um, but I'm glad I put a picture of it. It would have been so boring if there was just a white screen there. But uh, so you see um, this this dad talking talking to his son, and in the um, the clip was from the movie The Switch. Um, I won't go into details about what the switch is about, but Jason Bateman finds himself as, as a father. Um, and he is a father who does not know how to talk to children because he's an adult. And unless you do what we do, unless you're a teacher, you're not talking to adults every day. You're not talking to children every day, outside of your own children. So, and before you had children, you weren't talking to children every day. So it's hard to know how to talk to them. What are the words that you're supposed to use? And so in the clip, you see he's talking um, about basically existential dread um, to a six-year-old, and the little boy is just looking at him, but has his own questions and his own anxieties that, um, that also, and the clip also illustrates some of the heritability of, an anxi of anxiety, of anxiety, so anxiety that runs in the family um, as well. It also shows him uh, helping the child or help, uh, attempting to help the child overcome a situation with a bully. And so he comes in and tells the child exactly what to do. Well, not exactly what to do. Tells him to act like he doesn't give a fun yet. But the little boy doesn't know what that means, and of course, it doesn't really end well. But what happens is that uh, what we see is that this is a father who noticed um, noticed anxiety in a child, noticed that he also felt that same anxiety when he was that child's age, and wanted to very much wanted to change the outcome for the child. And so he swooped in and gave the child a solution, but did not swoop in and help the child process the emotion and process their own way to a solution. So you can look at it later on and do my commentary after. So 
So considerations that you often first start with is that worry is a component of parenting. You all have these children with no manual, and someone said, or no one said, hey, what you're supposed to do is keep them alive and put them on the straight and narrow. We're not gonna tell you how to do it. Just figure it out. So those are, but these are your, these are your little early humans that you are charged with, and um, that you would worry. <laughs> you worry. You worried when they were falling asleep. You would watch them while they make sure they were still breathing when they were asleep. When, you, when they first came home, then you had to send them off. I don't know what's happening. It's just. Okay. Then you had to send them off to school, and you didn't have eyes on them 24/7, and that was a big change. And then they haven't even started driving yet, and you have to unleash them on the open road of other people. So there's a lot of worry that's related to being a parent. That is developmental appropriate for you all as adults too. Um, but you all are crucial in the well-being of your children and a parental insight of what's going on with them is also crucial in your, ch your child's journey to well-being and health and well-being. That being said, there's no one to blame. So if you reflect and you find that, oh, maybe I shouldn't have said that, that's life. So we do that all the time. And so there's there's no blame because for how your children turned out. You did the best you could. And there are lots of components that are contributing to how your child is presenting anyway. So that's one thing to remember that it's definitely it's your responsibility, but it's definitely not your fault. Okay. So that being said, also, anxiety does have a family component. It runs in families. Research has shown us that there is strong evidence for these associations between parent anxiety and child anxiety. <laughs> So there are two ways that this happens. First is a ge genetic mechanism. So there are genes or traits that are passed down from, from parents to children that put them at risk for anxiety disorders. Um, there are also environmental mechanisms. So those include parent behavior and how it promotes anxiety, how it can promote anxiety. And also, if we're talking about parent and child anxiety that's occurring simultaneously, if parents and children are in the same situations that are anxiety inducing, then they would both have anxiety. So that could also explain some of those associations. If we're both in, in, in situations where we have to fear for our safety, then everybody, everybody in the house is going to have anxiety. But going back to um, parent behavior and how that promotes anxiety. So my disclosure to you that will not leave this room is that I am still in the process of learning how to ride a bike. I'm still in the process of learning how to ride a bike because when it was time for me to learn how to ride a bike, my parents, like any beautiful parents would do, got me a helmet. They got me a bike first. They got me a helmet. They also got me knee pads. They also got me elbow pads. They also got me wrist pads. And they put me on the bike and said, go. Now my mother's a psychologist, and as an adult, as when I became an adult, still didn't know how to ride a bike. She said, oh, it's our fault. We did it. She didn't follow my rules, not blame herself. It's our fault. We did it. We did everything short of strap pillows to you. And we conveyed this message that something horrible would happen to you if you fell off of this bike. I was like, yep, you're right, you sure did. And I I did not want to ride the bike because I thought I could break my neck. Clearly, they had to pad me up. And so there's sometimes when when parents trying to be overprotective or trying to be protective can end up being overprotective and can send a message to their child that something is horribly wrong with what they're doing or that there is more danger than there actually is. So that's one example of how parent behavior um, can promote anxiety. But I learned how to drive a car, so. <laughs> um, so how can parents help? The first thing they can do is assess your own discomfort and seek, and the second thing is seek help if you need it. Um, uh, this is a very common refrain on any plane. You've heard put your mask on before you assist small children or people who need your assistance. What I say at least five times a week is no one is going to help you your child if you have if you have fainted. So you have you must take care of yourself. And you must take care of yourself just for being a person who deserves to be taken care of. Not because you are a mom or a dad or a caregiver or a grandmother. No. You deserve to be taken care of, but you have to take care of yourself if you have any plans on taking care of other people. 
So figure out if you believe that you're one of those parents or caregivers who has experienced anxiety um, and that may be happening with your child, think about what worked for you. Remember, it might not always work for your child, but you can also think about what you would have wanted your parents to do, how you would have wanted your parents to help you. And so and that can help uh, shape and give you some starting points. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't work, that's okay too. Um, and then you can just get some more help. So the other piece is remembering that your child is, is strong and your child is capable. Uh, a lot of times we see that parents um, have different responses to different emotions. So parents will be, uh, can, you can get kind of indignant or kind of, uh, kind of agitated uh, when your child is angry, when they're mad at you because they won't give you, because you won't give them that second ice cream and you're thinking, I fed you all this good food, I gave you your ice cream, and now you have the audacity to be mad at me. So we have a different response to when the child is really anxious and doesn't want to sleep by themselves. And we think, oh no, they're anxious. We have to do something about it right now. There's a different response. Well, they're emotions. And so you are the way, but we perceive them in a different way. And so when we, when we see anxiety in a child, we immediately want to, we immediately want to comfort. And not saying that we should, we shouldn't comfort, but we also have to remember that that does not mean that your child is weak. That your child is still strong and your child is still capable of overcoming their anxiety. Your child, your child is still capable of being brave. I know it's a little loud, and I can understand how that feedback may be impacting you. Know, so let's see if I can step back a little bit. Um, also, what you can do is model appropriate language processing and problem solving. The next slide will go into that a little bit deeper. All right, so what does that mean? Here's some quick checks and steps for parents. Um, on the right side, the left side, you can see um, some well-meaning missteps. So these are things that we that, that we as um, mental health providers hear commonly um, when, when families first come in and present for treatment. So the missteps are allowing children to avoid fearful situations. So they don't want to go to school because school is scary and school is very uncomfortable, and so we stay home from school one day, then we stay home from school the second day. And before we know it, it's been a week that we've stayed home from school. Um, or I don't want to go, I don't want to go to soccer practice. The coach was mean to me last time, I'm not going to do it anymore. Soccer just doesn't work for us anymore. So Spending too much time reassuring. So if you spend about 20 minutes telling your child how the doctor's visit is going to be just fine and your child's already anxious, then your child might have been too anxious to even understand what you're saying when you're talking for 20 minutes, but all they know is that you did talk for 20 minutes, so it must be a big deal. It must be something that I really need to prepare for because my mom was really talking to me about it. So a lot of coming back to the reassuring. And if you're reassuring when you're talking to asking lots of questions, then, they, then each time they ask a question, they get an answer. And so there's no real reason to stop asking questions because she's going to keep on answering me and, and making me feel calm. That's what happens a lot when kids ask, ask, ask. Their anxiety builds up, you answer, and anxiety comes down again. Then their anxiety builds up, you answer, and it comes down again. So then a child has not learned how to bring their anxiety back down without you coming in and swooping in to answer the question. So that's how that behavior comes back over and over. So then you're, then you're also over-explaining and arguing. This happens a lot with uh, with teenagers. There's a lot of this is why this isn't going to happen, and just and kind of and just butting heads. Um, and then accidentally reinforcing those avoidant behaviors. One thing we'll say is that um, if a child does have to come home from school, that is not a fun day. That does not mean you get to watch TV, you get to sit and watch and play, play video games and eat ice cream. No, we're gonna do schoolwork. If you are so anxious that you can't be in school or you can't be in school today for whatever reason, because of, um, that's related to refusal, then we're not going to make it so that home is a super fun thing because I'm trying to do this every day. This is way better than school. 
So the flip side of that is, instead of allowing them to avoid, plan for how you're going to face those fears together. That does not mean throwing them to the wolves or flooding them. It means having a specific plan for gradually exposing them to some of the fear that, um, the fear experiences, um, or uh, planning for check-ins if they're going to if they're going to be doing something for an extended period of time. You can quickly answer questions the first time and then redirect and have some examples there um, coming on the next slide. But also, you can disengage from arguments that are unproductive, especially with teenagers. If we're having an unproductive argument, then it's time to step away. You're not going to be able to shout down or reason down their anxiety. So if that's the case, it's time to take a break. Because what you're doing is also modeling how to have an effective conflict resolution strategy. We're not going to raise our voices and yell. And as I said, you're not going to be able to change the mind of an anxious team. Um, what you can do is model a calm, stepping back from the argument, detangling those horns, and then, and then addressing it at a calmer time. And then also, instead of accidentally reinforcing those avoidant behaviors, you can reward and reinforce, reinforce facing the fears. What are we going to do after you've been so brave today in school? What are we going to do after you had such a brave day at the doctor's office? That may be, that may be Chick-fil-A time. Instead of saying, we're not going to go, no shots for us, let's go get Chick-fil-A. What do Chick-fil-A after you do the thing that needs to be done? And then the next slide. So other home remedies that you can use, um, so with gentle encouragement, so reflecting what they're saying. So you're feeling nervous, and I know you can do this. So you're reflecting with a turn. So reflecting with a, with a turn and a nod towards them actually completing the task. It looks like you're worried. I know you're going to be brave. Um, uh, we all feel scared. You can try your best, especially with performance-related anxiety. It's can, it can be nerve-wracking. Answer once and move on, like we talked about before. So I already answered that. What do you want for breakfast? New pivot. What kind of song do you want to listen to? What are we going to do next? And then as soon as they have shifted, that's when I would say give some positive reinforcement for actually shifting. Thank you for choosing what you want for breakfast. I really appreciate you letting me know that you want some orange juice. We'll engage with them in that way because that is also reinforcement. That feels good to them. You're talking to them. You're looking at them. And so let's do that once they have followed your lead to go and talk about something else. Substitute those questions for reflection. So we want to understand why they're anxious. What's making you so anxious? What happened? What are you worried about? These are the questions that are burning in our heads. They put kids on the spot, and now and so sometimes you just see them just shut down. And a lot of times they'll say, I don't know, because anxiety can be irrational. And they have them, they don't have a lot of vocabulary to explain exactly what the problem is. And especially if they are having a high amount of emotion, it's hard for them to even think and come up with those words. So rather than ask and peppering them with questions, we'll say, reflect what you see, and then kind of just do a little, just like toss, toss, toss up out there for them to respond to. It looks like you're worried, and you looked worried when you were out there. Um, I know the first day of soccer can be scary, and maybe they'll take it and run and say, yeah, and then this happened, or maybe they're just not, and they just know that you're there for them. But in that way, you haven't put them on the spot. Um, you can also offer a distraction. So again, we're back at home remedies. These are things that, um, that you would do before you've moved into uh, getting professional help. So distractions are good to a certain extent. For most children, they work well. Um, for kids who have really clinically significant anxiety, we want to make sure that we don't overuse distractions because we want kids to have an opportunity to sit in their anxiety and have it decrease without them taking their mind off of it. Because if they take their if you take your, their mind off of it, then they really haven't worked through it. They haven't sat and experienced the negative, the negative piece of it. If I had a difficult time talking in front of people, but all I did was just focus on that light, and I just forgot about the people who were standing in front of me, I didn't really do a good job of coping with my anxiety of talking in front of people. I did a really nice job of just forgetting where I was in that moment. So, but instead, I made sure I'm making eye contact with people, making sure I'm kind of reading people's facial expressions, looking at people and saying, oh, this person looks like they might not like what I'm saying, but I'm going to keep on talking because that's okay. That is a way that I'm engaging with any type of anxiety and discomfort that I have and letting it calm down and kind of roll over me. 
that takes practice. And then with, uh, with professional help, that's, that's one component of how we can help children. Um, again, um, we talked about that last one, making sure that avoiding discomfort doesn't mean enjoying something else as well as talking about with the video games at home. So seeking treatment. We can go to the next one. So when are you going to seek uh, professional help? That is, again, when it's getting in the way of functioning. It's getting in the way of routine functioning. Um, it's keeping them from attending school and interacting with their friends. That's the time to, um, to get into uh, professional help with older children, if it's impacting their grades, if it's impacting their ability to get tasks done and take tests, that's the time to seek help. Um, if there are any other behavior and mood changes, a lot of times you see persistent irritability with kids who are anxious. These are kids who are like, why are you asking me that? I don't, I don't care about that. I can't believe you keep on asking me how school was. I don't want to talk about it anymore. It's a lot of irritability, and that lets us know that, okay, there's something that's uncomfortable about this subject matter. Um, so when we see your irritability is also a component of depression in kids. And so those are pieces, if you're saying persistent irritability that's getting in the way of getting chores done or just the, the house is really not that fun anymore, that's another time to maybe get an evaluation to see if we can just kind of parse some things out. I don't know if that can. Okay. Um, you want to go to your, your child's pediatrician. They are the ones that have the connection to the connections to the resources in um, in the community. They're going to be the ones that can put those place those referrals, especially for community resources that require referrals from a medical provider. But they're going to be able to help you there. It's not always because the first line of defense is not always going to be medication management. However, the evidence based treatments for children with anxiety. Number one, the main one is something called Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, CBT. That focuses on understanding the connections between thoughts, your feelings, and your emotions. CBT uh, works best for, uh, for school-age children, so generally eight and up, because we need for children to be able to understand that cognitive component. You have to be able to understand what thoughts are before we can start talking about thoughts. There's some ways that we can remove that cognitive component and talk about the beat, the behavior piece, and I'll talk about that because we use that a lot with preschoolers. But it also means CBT with both the child and the parent because if you're coming in for therapy, you're coming in for one hour a week. One hour a week of us talking, of talk therapy and doing worksheet is not going to help. It has to be a constant, a, a constant homework kind of piece where parents are working on these things together. Um, for preschoolers, what we advise is something called as parent management training, which focuses on helping parents understand why children are having are, are emotionally dysregulated, why we're having big tantrums and, and stomping our foot and scrunching up our face, and helping parents get more comfortable when children are demonstrating these behaviors. Um, because if you're uncomfortable because your child starts crying, then we'll do whatever we can to stop the child from crying. And now we have reinforced the crying behavior. Um, you first handle those pieces and get more comfortable with your child's discomfort. And that way, you can use those skills with exposure to invite to experiences that they find um, uncomfortable. The primary pieces that we see with preschoolers are sleeping by themselves, talking to other people. And so we would treat that with gradual exposure. Um, a lot of times you'll see kids walking around our offices practicing talking to people and you get a sticker every time you practice talking to people. Well, before we did that, we had to make sure that mom and dad were not going to swoop in and say, oh, it's okay, or answer the questions for the child. But, but that meant that the parents had to become more comfortable with their level of discomfort when their child was uncomfortable, right? So those, those parents, things are happening at the same time. And because parents are uncomfortable, then kids can get uncomfortable, then kids yes, perceive that, yeah, yes. this really is a big deal, Come like I said before. Light. But they also never learn that never learn that they can manage those fears that parents keep on coming in to rescue them. So that's another reason why um, parent discomfort needs to be managed. We can go to the next one. That's, that's what we just talked about. Um, also, oh yes, we talked about too. <laughs> Okay, and then I have some resources for you all. Um, the scientific resources are there if you are just really curious about that COVID-19 meta-analysis, um, if you are really curious about the age onset for some of those anxiety disorders, uh, and if you're really interested about um, 
uh, kind of the biological components of how um, of how parents and children react and habituate to certain stimuli, then yeah. So if you want to nerd out on those things, that's fine. But <laughs> if that's not what you want to do, um, here's some books for you. So Freeing Your Child from Anxiety by Tamar Chansky is, um, is a staple of mine. She also has a book, Freeing Your Child from Negative Thinking. That's the third one in. Um, Parenting the Whole Brain Child is a nice book for just understanding how children process um, information. It's, it is a little bit more, it's kind of neuroscience-y, but it is helpful. And it, and it is written for, it's written for parents. So it's not, um, it's not necessarily just written for, for scientists, but, um, but it does provide just some, some nice information. And one of my favorites is How to Talk So Kids Will Listen. Um, and how to listen so kids will talk. Um, that uh, that clip that I couldn't share with Jason Bateman, he would have benefited for this from this one um, because a lot of times um, there are ways that we try to correct behaviors from children that aren't necessarily supporting it, them in the best ways. This is not ooey gooey like just kind of all sunshine and roses parenting. This is truly setting limits, but it's a it's the best a uh, better it's a better way to communicate with kids. Um, so those are books for parents. The next slide is going to be books for kids. Um, what to do when books are really nice. These are workbooks for children. Um, you can work on them together. They're kind of, they're in these little short chapters, but I like them as like right before bed books or some little small pieces that you can work in small chapters with. What to do when you worry too much, which means your brain gets stuck as an OCD. <coughs> um, also, Daniel Tiger for younger children. Um, there's a he has a book series, but also Daniel Tiger's um, Daniel Tiger's actual show has been scientifically proven to um, help children with uh, psychosocial and social emotional um, uh, endeavors and experiences. So that's one of the only shows that there's research to support. So if you're going to watch a TV show, I mean, screen time is fine. But Daniel Tiger is a good one to watch together. And the next one is books for teens. Uh, so I have a teen anxiety workbook that focuses on uh, CBT. And then another emerging therapy that helps with anxiety is something called acceptance and commitment therapy. And so this get out of your mind and into your life for teens is based on that therapy and that also has emerging evidence. Um, and so it's a, it's, a, it's a nice book to help children overcome anxiety through radical acceptance. Any questions? Well, that was fun. Yeah. Um, I actually do have a question. Yeah. Um, first of all, thank you for all the information that you, you know, presented in this presentation. I was going to ask um, if you could touch on it a little bit more about, because you said that obviously that anxiety can be hereditary and there's, you know, so many factors that can play a part with that. Well, when is it beneficial for um, parents or the caregivers and the child to kind of like undergo that therapy together. It's like, you know, like you said, the child may have, you know, their anxiety, but mom or dad or grandma, whomever, we can also be, you know, working through their own anxieties as well that can play onto the child as well. So we need to leave instead of just therapy for the child, what does it maybe need to be that it's Co-therapy. Co-therapy. Yeah. Yes, so co-therapy or at least um, there's some simultaneous treatment seeking right. there too. Yes, um, it would be great if it could be co-therapy if you were working with someone who could see both of you. Um, the, the answer to that is a great question because the answer to that is kind of similar to when we want to seek, seek treatment for the children. It's when it's in parent functioning. So if a parent's anxiety is preventing them from effectively uh, being involved in the child's treatment, so if the child, if the parent is so anxious that they're not helping their child with their exposure, so the parent is so anxious that they're not helping their child with their homework, um, with their therapy homework, that's the time when the parent anxiety is, is hindering the child's well-being and the child's growth there. So that would be a, a key time when we need to shift and say, let's talk about um, parents' discomforts in these situations. Or, and, and then in general, if it's just, of course, if it's impacting overall things at the home, we're not leaving the house because we're so anxious. So then we can't come, can't come to therapy, but there are other things that mom and dad aren't doing because they maybe have um, uh, some pretty significant anxiety that prevents them from doing their day-to-day -day tasks. Great question. 
Thank you so much for your sharing. And I have a question. Like we usually encourage our kids, but I feel like, especially he's a boy, right? <laughs> he's kind of stubborn. And um, I have to punish him sometimes, but I, I, I can hardly you know, choose a, a, a proper right degree of punishment. Like if I, I punish him too hard, I, I don't want him to be, you know, uh, to get anxiety. But if too, not too hard, he doesn't follow. He doesn't, you know, he doesn't. He's not scared at all. Yeah. Uh -huh. So, yeah. so will there be any idea or examples how I should punish my boy? He's like. Three year old. Three. I was like, that's the yeah. first question. How old is it about? <laughs> um, and so it depends on that. All it depends on um, on the infraction. So it depends on what they've done. Um, and so there are for three year olds, we generally use removal of privileges as a disciplinary strategy. That's the consequence. So it's um, so you're saying punishment. I'm saying consequence. Technically, they're almost the same thing, and so um, if privileges are removed, small privileges are removed, and those are any that's anything from getting getting to press the button to open up the garage to getting the lollipop that somebody handed them at the doctor's office. So if there's a removal of privileges because they did not follow your instructions, that's appropriate, but it's very quick, it's very short. We're not saying you don't get to go trick-or-treating because you didn't follow my instructions. We're saying that you are gonna miss this immediate privilege that's right here in front of you that you were gonna get in the next 30 to, to 30 seconds to one minute. Um, as kids get older, removal of privileges also works for an extended period of, periods of time, like maybe like for five-year-olds, we would say, or six-year-olds, you maybe have lost tablet privileges for the rest of the day for something big, like um, like taking something that you weren't supposed to take or touching something you weren't supposed to touch uh, or breaking house rules. Um, but they also always get to earn it back, or they start fresh the next day. That's how. That's one of. That's one of the biggest mistakes that we see in terms of trying to make sure that children understand the punishment is that we may th take things away for days and days on end. But if you're a younger child, it doesn't like you just get used to not having it, and so then there's something else that's just as exciting. And so when you take things away for maybe a period of hours, they feel it. It stings and they get it back the next day with a reminder of this is how you keep this privilege by doing this. So they have something to work towards keeping as opposed to just uh, just the fear of taking things away. Also for big big things like hitting and, and aggression, we use timeout. As a role at timeout, but you don't do timeout the K-way yet, so if you do a timeout the K-way, then it can work. Thank you. No problem. I kind of missed uh, the name for the kind of therapy, the evidence-based therapy for preschoolers. For preschoolers, that's parent management training therapy. And, and this, the with exposure. Uh, behavioral therapy, that's for older children. children. Okay. For yeah. eight, 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 and and above. Above. eight and above. I mean, depending on how precocious the child is, it just depends on their cognitive capacity. We can do some work there, but again, it really heavily relies on parents. Like my boy, when I try to take away some privilege or I try to punish him, go against his own will, he can cry up to 30 or 40 minutes and he doesn't stop and almost lose his voice. Mm -hmm. So at this moment, should I like give in and try to give, show my care that I still love him or I just, uh, you know, just uh, fight against him and like because I, I, I worry he can lose his voice or, or damage permanently. Yeah. If you keep crying. Yeah. So in that way, I don't know why I should, you know, just uh, stay stay on my bottom line or just give in. So that's a, you've gotten into a battle of wills. There are two things that you can do. The first thing um, is so when children get so dysregulated, especially young children, and they get dysregulated, they kind of two two different situations. So let's say he has a tantrum because he got his ice cream. The ice cream fell on the ground. He starts crying. He had plans for that ice cream. He was disappointed because the ice cream fell. It's not anybody's fault. He was just really upset. You tried to calm him down. You said he was going to get another ice cream. He still screamed. In those situations, I would say, you're upset. I'll talk to you when you calm down. The next piece, and then so then you have to push. And so it might be 30, it's 40 minutes. Right before you, right when you think you're going to give in, I'm going to ask you to pull it out just a little bit longer. And as soon as he starts to calm himself down, that's when you give him that attention and all of that love. Because what can happen is, 
if you give him all kinds of attention and love and calm and rub him down while he's in the height of that tantrum and screaming, mm -hmm. then what we've done is we've given him something really good that he likes right when he's doing something that you don't like. And so now we've accidentally reinforced that behavior because he says, all right, well, if I scream loud enough, then mama's gonna come and hug me. But what he needs to learn is that when I calm down, that's when mama's gonna come and hug me. But mama always loves me, even when I'm screaming and screaming and crying and kicking. And it's because mama loves me that she's ignoring me this whole time. He's not gonna learn that until he's 33 years old. But in the moment, um, you're teaching him that good things happen once he uses his own strength to calm himself down. Yeah. But it's very difficult, extremely difficult to do. Yeah. Thank you. It's a good technology. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's some, I'll, I'll come and give you some books later on. I can show you some book recommendations yeah. for that too. I think my um, son, um, he's 10 years old. Um, but I think uh, during his uh, preschool age and kindergarten age, early age, he has a selective uh, new system, mm -hmm. the, the one you say it. And so in the class, he didn't talk much. And uh, the kindergarten teacher thinks he doesn't speak or doesn't speak English at all. And, but he speaks at home and with the brothers, but just show shine. But um, during that time, we didn't realize. I'm not sure. If during that time, who does he need therapies or just let him grow? And right now, every year I see his he grow out of that and more uh, uh, brave to express his opinion. But, mm -hmm. but I can see my four year old. Um, she has kind of like this when she go to the preschool, new school, and she doesn't want to say hi or say it very quietly then nobody can notice mm -hmm. sometimes it takes two months for her to finally uh, open up to say hi mm -hmm. to the teacher or something mm -hmm. is it uh, when is the uh, time to seek for therapy so um so that's a, that is a that's a longer time to to uh to, to warm and again, it's if, if that if, if that's the only thing that she finally does open up and she warms, and that's then then that may and that's the only piece, and that's okay. And um, but if you're if you're starting to see that there's some other aspects that are that you're worried about, it's always the right time for an evaluation. That means somebody can ask you lots of questions, and then they can tell you if we need some additional help or not. But if you are concerned, then that's the right time for an evaluation. But uh, how can you decide if it's a disorder or if it's a children's personality? Maybe some children just are shy. You're absolutely right. The question is if it starts impacting things that they need to do on a day-to-day -day basis. That's when it becomes a disorder. If they're not getting things done that need to get done. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think they are ready for you all to come in. Thank you so much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.